So I suppose my story really began when I was about 13 years old when a close family friend who was like an uncle to me passed from pancreatic cancer. And when the disease hit so close to home, I knew I needed to learn more. So I went online to find answers. And using Google and Wikipedia, I found a vast array of statistics on these diseases. But what I found really shocked me. You see, 85% of all pancreatic cancers are diagnosed late, when someone has less than a 2% chance of survival. And as I dug deeper, I was wondering, why on earth are we so bad detecting these cancers? And that's when I found an even more shocking statistic. Our current test is a 60-year-old test. I mean, first off, that's older than my dad. But also costs $800 per test and is grossly inaccurate, missing 30% of all cancers. Your doctor would have to be ridiculously suspicious that you have the disease in order to give you this test. And thus, the vast majority of them go undiagnosed until it's far too late. So uh, I set out, uh, armed with eighth grade biology, to change the face of cancer diagnostics. It's a bit lofty of a goal, but my kind of reasoning was the current test sucks so much that anything I do will probably be marginally better. <laughs> so armed with this optimistic go-getter attitude, I set out and I found what a sensor for pancreatic cancer would really have to look like in order to be effective. It would have to be inexpensive, rapid, simple, sensitive, selective, and minimally invasive. And I was pretty sure I could do this. I wasn't exactly sure how. So I kept digging, and I then found why we haven't updated our tests for pancreatic cancer in over six decades. And that's because when we're looking for these diseases, we're looking at your bloodstream, particularly for these variations in protein levels. And while this sounds really straightforward, it's anything but because you have liters and liters of blood that's already abundant in thousands of different of proteins. And you're looking for this tiny change in a single amount of a single protein. And it's next to impossible. It's like trying to find a needle in a stack of nearly identical needles. However, undeterred due to my teenage optimism or how some people labeled it in complete and utter ignorance of the entire field of cancer research, I continued on, and I then found a database of over 8,000 proteins that are found in your bloodstream when you have these cancers. And uh, my mission was to find one that would work. And it was my summer break. I had nothing else to do. So I shut myself in my room and researched all 8,000 proteins. And that made for some really interesting back-to-school essays. Like, my teachers were like, what did you do this summer? And my friends were like, oh, we went to, like, Yellowstone, or we went, like, to summer camp. And I'm like, I research proteins. <laughs> Always a very awkward pause after that, but uh, I never really shook the name protein kid. However, I kept going, and then on the 4,000th try, when I was close to losing my sanity, I finally found the one protein that could work. And the name of this protein was called mesothelin. And it's just your ordinary, run-of-the-mill type protein, unless, of course, you have pancreatic, ovarian, or lung cancer, in which case it's found these very high levels in your bloodstream. But also, the key is, is that it's found in the early stages of the disease, when someone has close to 100% chance of survival. So if you could detect this protein, you could detect the cancers when survival is at its best. But now, of course, the question was, how on earth am I going to detect this thing? And my answer came in the most unlikely places for me. My high school biology class, which was the absolute stifler of innovation, I hired my biology teacher and she hated me. And uh, one day, tensions rose to record highs. And I decided to rebel how any typical teenager would. I snuck in an article on single walled carbon nanotubes. You could really tell I was like the bad kid on the block. Like, instead of like, uh, like doing other things like graffiti or stuff, I rebelled by bringing in science articles. However, uh, these carbon nanotubes, they're really interesting. They're these long, thin tubes of carbon. They're an atom thick, and they're 150,000 the diameter of a single strand of your hair. So they're extremely small, but they have these amazing properties. They're kind of like the superheroes of material science. For example, they're stronger than steel and can conduct electricity better than copper. So I was pretty much obsessed with these things. So I snuck in this article, and had, I felt pretty sneaky. I had it wedged between the pages of my biology textbook under my desk. And I was reading about all these properties. And at the same time, we were learning about these things called antibodies. And antibody, it's like a lock and key. It will only react to one specific protein. In this case, that cancer biomarker I had found. And I was just sitting there, 
when all of a sudden it hit me. You could combine these two concepts, and what you end up with is a network of nanotubes laced with antibodies. And this creates a carbon substance that will only react to one specific protein. But also, due to the amazing properties of these nanotubes, it actually changes how electricity flows through it based on the amount of protein present, and thus indicate whether or not you have pancreatic cancer. And essentially how it's working is you can imagine having a giant bowl of spaghetti, and when you put meatballs in it, it'll spread neighboring noodles apart. And if you instead imagine those noodles as uh, the carbon nanotubes and the meatballs as antibodies, what's happening is those antibodies, they latch onto that protein and form these beefed up molecules that spread the neighboring nanotubes apart. And that'll cause less connections between individual nanotubes and thus less pathways for electrons to take when you're running an electrical current through it. And so it's like trying to take all of you guys and shove you through one door instead of seven. It's a lot more difficult. And so the electrical resistance will actually go up. And you measure that using a $50 ohm meter you steal from your dad's garage and don't tell him about for four months. <laughs> he eventually found out, and uh, that was an awkward discussion. However, uh, I kept going, and making, then I was thinking, well, these networks of nanotubes, they're very delicate. And since they're so flimsy, they need to be supported. So I chose to use paper, and making a paper sensor for pancreatic cancer is about as simple as making chocolate chip cookies, which I personally love. If I ever bomb a test, those cookies will be gone. However, all you do is you take some water, you pour in the nanotubes, add some antibodies, mix it up, take some paper, dip it, dry it, and you can detect cancer. It's literally as simple as that. And just as I had this idea in like the back of my biology class, I look up and I swear my teacher, she has like eyes on the back of her head. She whirls around all red in the face, storms up to my desk and snatches that oracle out of my hands. I was like, what is this actual science doing in my classroom? <laughs> At least that's what I thought she said. She probably said something more along the lines like, do your homework or else I'll fail you. And after class, I had to like go and like listen to this 30 minute long like lecture about respecting myself and others. And I finally got her to give my article back. That's all I really wanted. And then I kept going and I was like, well, I'm probably going to need a lab to do this research. I couldn't really do cancer research on my kitchen countertop. And uh, me and my brother had done some pretty crazy things in our kitchen. Like, for example, I cultured like E. coli where we make our sandwiches in the morning. Yeah. Luckily, the CDC didn't have to be called in. And then, like, my brother, he makes these high voltage electronics in the basement. It's like, oh, yes, this is like one million volts. And, like, he knocked out the entire, like, he, like power for the house or something. It was terrible. And uh, then also we landed ourselves or my mother on the FBI watch list due to our online shopping history. <laughs> Like typically, like what comes in the mail for your children is like a report card. This instead was like a letter from the FBI. So it was like a very awkward conversation when we got home for dinner. However, I was like, I'm going to a lab to do this research. I couldn't ask for like cancer cells for Christmas. And so they emailed 200 professors at Johns Hopkins University in the National Institute of Health. And it's essentially this email saying, can you please work in your lab? I have this cool idea. And it was a 30 page long behemoth of a document outlining each and every aspect of my procedure. I send it out and I expect all these positive responses to pour in. I'd like pick and choose my lab and like be hailed as Wonder Boy saves the world. No, reality struck and I got 199 rejections. And I realized professors aren't nearly as nice as those glowing profile pictures make them seem. They're all like smiling and then they like take their red pen and just say it was like the worst idea they'd ever seen and I should just quit science now. And, but finally, I got one positive response from Dr. Anirbhai Maitra at Johns Hopkins University. And so I go in for this big interview, it's after school, and I go in my most professional attire of sweatpants and a hoodie. And I go in expecting like a normal interview, like, oh, what's your favorite color? What do you want to be when you grow up? No. This guy has a PhD in nanomedicine and brought 28 PhDs plus himself into this like three meter, three meter by three meter room. We priced at some like Guinness Book of World Records for like population density or something there. And I just sit down and they just start firing these questions at me. I had no clue what they were talking about. My knowledge of cancer biology was a six months crash course I gave myself using Google and Wikipedia. So I guess to see, just like I do on any uh, test that I have, and like with those multiple choices, like always check to see. So that's what I did. And I got through the interview, and they were like, OK, you can come work in our lab. And I was like, wow, really? Like I, I wasn't expecting like you guys to accept me after that interview. However, I go in, 
And I had no clue what I was doing in the lab. I mean, like, I'd never really worked in the lab. I'd worked in my, like, makeshift home lab. And so I just, like, kind of followed the, like, postdoc student that was mentoring me. I followed him around for, like, what seems like two hours. I am, like, not touching anything because I'm, like, if I touch it, I'll break it, and there goes my college tuition. And uh, finally, they're like, okay, you actually have to do something here. And so they sit me down, and they're like, culture some cancer cells. And culturing cancer cells is really the easiest thing you'll ever do. All you do is you take some, like, one flask, and you pour the fluid from it into another flask. And I sneezed in my second flask. It's like, cancer, it's pretty hard to kill off. It's like an immune system or something. No, there were, like, tentacles growing out the next day. I just kind of hid it under my lab bench and kept feeding it to see what it would grow into. It's like, instead of a regular, like, pet, I had this weird, like, monster living under my, like, lab bench. But my professor finally found out about it and was like, all right, you need to get rid of this. Um, however, then I'd, like, proceed to screw up every imaginable scientific procedure. Like, I'd trip over my shoes and break my cells, or I'd, like, overheat them in the incubator and kill them, or I'd, like, blow them up in the centrifuge. I probably committed cellular genocide on some level, but the UN tribunal has not been after me on those charges. But I kept going, and finally, after seven months of screwing up every imaginable scientific procedure, I ended up with one small paper sensor that costs three cents and takes five minutes to run. And this makes it 168 times faster, over 26,000 times less expensive and over 400 times more sensitive than our current methods of detection. But also, it can detect the cancer in the early stage, when something has close to 100% chance of survival. And so far, it has over 90% accuracy at detecting these cancers. So in the next two to five years, this patent-pending sensor could lift the once dismal pancreatic cancer survival rates from 5.5% to close to 100%, and do similar for ovarian and lung cancer. But it wouldn't stop there. You can simply switch out that antibody, as simple as switching out butterscotch chips for chocolate chips and cookies, and detect an entirely di different disease. So you could detect things ranging from Alzheimer's, other forms of cancer, even HIV, AIDS, and heart disease. The possibilities are literally endless. And through this journey, I learned a lot of lessons, and I faced a lot of adversities. Like, my parents told me no, my teachers told me no, literally everyone told me no. And uh, they were like, do something else for your science fair. At least, like, I didn't do a paper mache volcano for my science fair. However, the biggest difficulty I faced wasn't being told no by everyone. It wasn't any difficulties I faced in the lab. It was actually getting access to information, or what we call scientific paywalls. A scientific paywall is essentially where you have to cough up $35 per scientific article in order to read it. And this makes the cost of research exponentially more expensive, and it really hinders the ability for researchers to do research, particularly for young researchers such as myself. And we have all these big STEM initiatives, especially in the US, where we say we need more kids interested in science. But when a seminal science article costs $35 and a Katy Perry single costs 99 cents, it's a bit of a mixed message there. And this isn't just a problem for like 15-year-old cancer researchers. This is a problem for everyone. You see, recently, Harvard University released a statement to its faculty and students basically saying we simply can't afford paying for these subscriptions anymore. Their prices have just increased exponentially. Some journals have $40,000 per year subscriptions that you have to buy. And what does it say about the world of academic publishing, the flow of information, and the accessibility of knowledge when Harvard University, the richest academic institution in the world, can't afford to continue paying for its subscriptions. By instituting these paywalls, we've created this very rigid class hierarchy for knowledge, where at the top we have these knowledge billionaires and millionaires, those big name institutions and labs that can afford each and every one of these articles. But even among these knowledge elite, we have a bit of stratification, where at the top, we have those big name institutions like MIT, Yale, Stanford, and Harvard that can afford every single article out there. But then lower down, we have these state-run institutions that don't have as large of endowments and thus can't afford to buy every single article. And thus, the researchers can't have access to the exact same tools those researchers at those larger institutions have. So basically, we're discriminating your access to knowledge based on how much money you or your institution has. And this tier-based dissemination of knowledge simply isn't effective and it isn't working for scientific collaboration. But then lower down, we have the knowledge middle class, people like you and me. We can access a few open access articles out there and maybe buy an article or two. But then we have the knowledge underclass, 
5.5 billion people who lack access to the internet and are living in knowledge poverty. So essentially, only, 80, only about 85% of the world's population is living in knowledge poverty, while 0.008% of the world's population, those are the only people who can access scientific information. That's like taking 80 people off the street of like London and saying you guys are the only ones who can access scientific information, everyone else in the city, too bad for you. And so essentially we're living in a knowledge aristocracy where not everyone has access to the same tools and thus we're stymieing our ability to collaborate scientifically and we're throwing away 85% of our human capital in terms of scientific innovation. But imagine if instead we could live in a knowledge democracy where what you look like, age, or gender doesn't apply. Whether you're from China to Cambodia, from Mexico to Malaysia, whether you're a billionaire or living on less than a dollar a day, you'd have the exact same access to scientific information. Because science shouldn't be a luxury, and knowledge shouldn't be a commodity. It should be a basic human right. Because the minds of the people must be free, and that means the minds of everyone, not the minds of a select few who can afford these articles. And I believe that we can institute this change. Because think, if a 15-year-old who didn't know where pancreas was could find new ways to attack pancreatic cancer, just imagine what we all can do together. Thank you.